Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to my brand new Design Patterns video tutorial. You learn about design patterns so that you can solve software design problems in tried and true ways. And I'm going to try to do a whole bunch of different things in this tutorial that I've never done before. It's going to be very code heavy. However, it's also going to bounce back and forth between the presentation style that you see right here. We're going to start off in the beginning of this tutorial reviewing basic OOP concepts and not so basic OOP concepts. And I hope that this is very interactive and you guys talk to me and talk, tell me what you don't understand because this is definitely going to be, to a certain extent, a lecture sort of presentation. Lecture doesn't mean it's boring. It just means that I want you to completely understand this concept. Now, of course, if you followed any of my other tutorials and you have any interest in Java at all, which is going to be our chosen language for analyzing design patterns, you, of course, create a class. That class is made up of fields or instant variables, and these are all the things that the object knows about itself. It also is going to define all the methods or functions that this object is going to need, or in other words, what this object is going to do. Whenever you are going to be creating superclasses like we have here with animal, as well as subclasses like we have here with bird, and other subclasses such as dog, you're going to figure out what things are similar between all these subclasses, and then you're going to, technical term, abstract out those features into the superclass. Then after that point, you're going to either, like we do with the bird subclass up here, you're going to override certain methods, like we did here with move, because a bird more than likely is going to move in a different way than most other animals, or you're going to extend the superclass, like we did here with dog, where we added a brand new method called dig hole. And this to a certain extent is a UML diagram which we're going to get a lot more into. My goal here is to turn you into a very very good programmer that can create almost anything. And this whole entire game that is going on here where we're taking animal and creating bird from it and taking animal and creating dog from it is what we refer to as inheritance. It is inheriting all the fields as well as all of the methods of the superclass. Then, of course, you're going to want to take all of the fields and make them private. And we're going to get more into that in a second. And you're going to create public methods that you are then going to use to change these private variables that you have up here. And as you can see here, we have the dog subclass of animal. And we're going to extend the animal class using the extends word. And then we are going to further extend the animal class by adding the new dig hole method like we have right here. And just want to reiterate, whenever you are going to extend a superclass, you are, of course, all of the methods as well as fields that are in the superclass are already going to be defined inside of the subclass dog like we have here in this situation. And it is your responsibility only to define what things change in the subclass. So what exactly is main for? Main is going to be used from here on out. I know in the past I used main for all kinds of things, but from here on out, main is going to create all your objects and then help them to interact with each other. Like we did here, we took the dog subclass and named it Grover. We're going to create a new dog object. And of course, we're going to set the value for name using the set name method. We are not going to, from this day forward, ever try to set a value for a field by referencing it directly. Why? Well, here's a good reason. It is called encapsulation. And what it allows us to do is to protect all of our data. Like we have here, I have set weight. Now, if somebody wanted to come in here to the dog object and give it a weight that was less than zero, that would never make any sense. So we can perform certain types of checks inside of these methods, like we do here to make sure that the weight is greater than zero before we assign this new weight to our dog object. Otherwise, we're going to throw an error. And this, by the way, is called a parameter. Whenever you define the type of variable that is going to be passed to a method, it is referred to as a parameter. This, however, which is the value that is going to be passed to the method set name, like we have here in this situation, is referred to as the argument. And then we are going to, like I said before, hide all of our data by making this private, meaning our fields or our instance variables, and then using what are called setter and getter methods to make changes to these private variables that we have up here. So what's the difference between an instance variable versus a local variable? And I'm going to demonstrate all this stuff, by the way, inside of code. An instance variable or a field is declared inside of a class, like we have here with the private int weight. 
However, local variables are going to be created inside of methods, like we have here, with gram malt. And this method, if you don't know, is just going to convert pounds into grams. So this is a field. It is created for the class. And this is a local variable. It's created inside of methods. So how do you decide if a class should extend another class? One way is to use the isA principle. And it's quite simple. All you would simply say is, is a dog an animal? If the answer to that is yes, then chances are dog would be a good subclass for the superclass animal. However, you can see down here when we use the is a principle on is a dog a cat, this makes absolutely no sense. So in this situation, cat would not be a superclass for the dog. You can also use the has a principle to decide if a certain class should have a specific field. If you can say dog has a height, well, that makes sense then in that situation, that height would be a field for the object or the class named dog. So when exactly should you use inheritance? Well, like we said before, if the is a principle works, like dog is an animal works, then chances are inheritance makes a lot of sense. Also, when a subclass needs most of the methods in the superclass, like we have with the animal in relation to the dog class, where almost every method inside of animal is going to work with dog, that also is a good situation where inheritance is going to help you out. You should, however, not use inheritance just to reuse code. Once again, if the is a principle doesn't work or the is an principle doesn't work, inheritance also probably doesn't make sense. So what are some other reasons why we use inheritance? It helps us avoid duplicate code. Changes to the superclass code is instantly reflected in all of the subclasses. And the user knows that all subclasses have all of the methods automatically that are created inside of the superclass. Let's jump into the code and start creating some of these guys. So we're going to come in here. I have all the code underneath the video, and it's actually a little bit more verbose than what I'm going to present here. So we're going to create our animal class, and we're going to create a private string, and it's going to be name, private double, it's going to be height, private int, is going to be weight, private string is going to represent sound. And then after we create all those guys, we need to create our setter and getter methods. So public void set name, it's going to receive a string, new name. And whenever I only have one line statements like this, I like to keep everything on one line. So I'm going to say whatever the value of new name is in this situation, I'm going to set it up that way. And then of course, we're going to have to create a getter function. It's going to return a string, get name. And again, because it's only going to do one thing, I'm going to put this on one line and it's going to return the value of whatever name is. And I'm actually going to get height out of here because I don't need it for this part of the presentation. Copy that, do a couple things here. Like we said before, with set weight, it's going to receive an integer. It's going to be new weight. However, in this situation, this guy's going to do more than one thing, so I'm not going to try to put all that on one line, which would be a horrible idea. I'm going to instead go if, and then I'm going to check if the weight that they are going to be sending is greater than zero. If it is, and that makes sense, I'm going to say weight is equal to whatever the value of new weight is, right like that. Else, I could do something like system out and say something like weight must be bigger than zero. And then also with our getter function, it's just going to go get weight and then return whatever the value of weight is. Pretty simple. And then I can also do a similar thing with sound, which is going to make a lot of sense. And of course, change this to int. And then here we're just going to change this to set sound, new sound, sound, new sound, get sound, return sound. And that is all that we're going to need to define at this point in time for animal.java and next we're going to create dog.java and to extend this guy we're just going to go public class dog extends animal which is the super class and then we're going to go public void because this extends that super class system out and let's just say dug a hole so pretty simple and then the constructor, of course, is going to initialize every object that is created. And we're just going to go public dog. If you want to reference the constructor file or the initializer method for this superclass or animal, you just call super, just like that. And then, of course, we could do things like set sound equal to bark, like we did right there. Well, now that we know that, let's go in and create our cat. So we're going to jump into cat.java. And it's going to be very similar, and except this is, of course, going to be called cat. It's not going to dig a hole, so we can get rid of that, even though cats do dig holes. But in this situation, it's not going to. And then we're going to go cat, reference to super, and our cat in this situation is going to say meow. 
And now that we have that defined, we're going to create another class called Work with Animals, which is going to do exactly that. And this is going to be public class work with animals. And we're going to see how these guys work together. Inside of here, you're going to see public static void main, which we've seen many times before. And then we can start playing with these guys. So we're going to create a new dog object, and it's going to be called Fido is equal to new dog. That's a call to the constructor file to initialize Fido. And then we can start doing things like Fido set name and give it the name Fido. And then we can check that that name actually stuck by going Fido get name. And then we're going to do a couple other things like Fido access the method that is only inside of the dog class. And we're going to see exactly what happens when we try to give Fido a negative weight. And let's file save that and execute it. And you can see right here, Fido's printed out. And that comes from this line right here. Dug a hole comes whenever we call the method inside of the dog class. And weight must be bigger, which is the error that is triggered from the animal class whenever we try to give it a negative weight. Something that comes up all the time that people have trouble with is what you have to understand is everything is passed by value inside of Java. So that means if I come in here and create an integer and give it the value of 10, and then I'm actually going to have to jump into fight or into the dog class to create this guy. I'm going to create a method called public void change var int random number. And I'm going to use the same exact name. Random number is equal to 12. I'm going to give it a value of 12 here. And then we're just going to copy this guy up here. Don't want to copy that. And then go rand num in method. And I'm going to say something like rand num. Okay, so rand num was passed into this. And then I gave it a value of 12. And then I'm going to print out rand num on the screen inside of the method. Meanwhile, after I save that, I'm going to jump back over into the work with animals class. And I'm going to go Fido change var and pass it random number like that. Now, based off of doing that, after I have already printed this out the screen and random has changed values, I'm going to go rand num after method call like this and then print out the value for random number. And you're going to see random number here is 10. Then we call this method, which is over here inside a dog which changed the value of random number to 12. Random number in method is going to print out 12 here. However, when we bounce back over here, you're going to see that this says 10. Now let's execute it just to show you. And there you are. Random number into methods 12. Random number after the method call is 10. Nothing has changed here. And this just it reinforces the fact that whenever you pass a value to a method, even if it is passed through a variable, this on the screen is identical to this. So just understand that. And let's undo that. That comes up way more often than you would imagine. And objects, on the other hand, are passed by references. So down inside of here, let's just do it right here. I'm going to go public, static, void. And static in this situation, what this guy means is that any methods that are in a class, however they are not tied to an object, must be labeled as static. So what static means is every single object that is ever created from this class, they're all going to have the same static methods as well as static variables. And I'll get more into static variables probably in the next part of the tutorial. But that's what static means. Static, unlike methods like we have here with animal, set name. See, you can see here there is no static. That's because every single object is going to have its own special set name method that it can work with. Meanwhile, this guy here is not. We're going to change object name and we're going to say that it receives an object and I'm just going to let it be called Fido. And then I'm going to go Fido set name and I'm going to give it the value of Marcus. Now, if this worked the way that other variables worked, remember this is an object or a reference to an object anyway, then the value would not change whenever we would go change object name and we pass it the dog object named Fido. And then we print out the screen dog name after method call and Fido get name. And if we save that and execute it, you're going to see that the dog's name has been changed to Marcus like you have right there. And there should be a space in there. And there you go. Now you can see Marcus. So this is a reference to the object that is being passed. Any changes to this object will affect this object across all of your code. 
And this differs from ver regular old variables whenever they are passed just simply by value. Now, in the next part of the tutorial, I'm going to get into polymorphism, abstract classes, interfaces, final, and a whole bunch of other things that come up all the time in regards to object-oriented programming. Please feel free to leave any questions or comments below. Otherwise, till next time.